As we have selected a rather unusual title and topic for this series of instructions, perhaps it will be wise to establish a certain background relating to the author whose works we are to examine. In the first place, General Albert Pike, whose life covered the greater part of the 19th century, was one of the outstanding men of his time. His career was so broadly diversified that he brought to almost any subject with which he was concerned not only a profound theoretical scholarship, but also a wide personal experience covering more activities than are crowded into the life of the average person. General Pike belonged to the same family as Zebulon Pike, the explorer. And he belonged to a period, an American background. And we find that his family reached America in the 17th century. And from that time on, it become an essential part of our tradition. General Pike himself presents a number of interesting, remarkable facets. Perhaps one of the most unusual is his struggle for an education. He was of a considerable family, and his father was of humble means. Therefore, from the beginning, it was necessary for a pike to find his own way. He early exhibited a remarkable scholarship. And by the time he reached college years, he passed successfully every examination necessary for his entrance into Harvard. He also was one of those young men who found it necessary to work his way to an education, and he prepared as best he could for what he regarded to be an essential form of training in the unfoldment of his own instincts and desires. Finally, having attained a sufficient amount of funds to pay for the first part of his scholastic year, he made the long and difficult journey to Harvard some say on foot, in order to conserve what means he had. Arriving there, he was informed that his scholastic standing was satisfactory in every way, but that he could not enter the college unless he could pay for both terms or one year's work. Being utterly unable to do so, he was forced to give up his hope, for at that time apparently there were no scholarships available as today. This was said to have been his first heartbreak, and it was not entirely compensated for when in his older years, Harvard offered him an honorary degree. At that time, he declined with thanks, saying that when he had come in need of an education, they could not provide it, and by the time they had so graciously offered it, he no longer stood in need of it. This particular point is one of many anecdotes, and as we go through the series, we will occasionally introduce some of these, but we do not wish to make the entire evening anecdotal, so that uh, we will pass on to a few important points. Finding education on a formal level, more or less closed to him by his own poverty, uh, Pike followed the general practice of young men of his time and went west. In the course of this journey, he went along through Missouri and finally came into New Mexico and stopped for some time at Taos. From there, he proceeded into the Indian country, uh, establishing a trapping uh, line or servicing a group of traps in order to make a living. 
It was with his early contact with the Indians that he came to have certain understanding and appreciation for their values. Uh, these were to form an important part of his later career. After other vicissitudes, he finally settled in Arkansas, where he became known as a good Arkansas gentleman. In these days also, he supported himself by school teaching and gradually became a more or less influential member of the Arkansas Society of the time, if we wish to so designate it. He improved himself in law and finally became an outstanding lawyer, and the records of the period of his residence in Arkansas show that he was involved in nearly one-third of the litigations in the area. He was elected also to office and assisted in preparing the papers for the incorporation of the city of Little Rock. In these same years, he took an interest in newspaper editing, became the temporary manager of a newspaper and owner thereof, a, a procedure which has been noted as having resulted in a marked literary improvement in the journal. But apparently the journal also weighed rather too heavily upon him, and he finally relinquished most of his influence in journalism in order to continue his practice of law. Life moved on with him uh, in this way until the Civil War, at which time he received the commission of Brigadier General in the Confederate Army, and it is from thence comes his title of General. He was given command over a large group of American Indian soldiers, and this was one of the most difficult positions which he was required to fill. Uh, at that time, the Confederacy was very much afraid that the Indians would become involved in the Civil War, and that therefore every effort should be made to regulate and direct their activities in a more or less orderly manner. General Pike was given this difficult matter to handle and he later became also involved in the great Cherokee migration, which is one of the rather unpleasant episodes in American history, one of the most terrible experiences through which the Indian ever passed. Needless to say, Pike was on the side of the Indian. In this uh, way, his life went on, and with it a continuous process of scholarship. Uh, his home uh, was at one time uh, surrounded by Union soldiers while he was in the army, not there, with the intent of burning it down. But when the commanding officer saw the library and other evidences of extraordinary scholarship in the house, he placed an honor guard around it and would not permit the house to be injured in any way. With all other Confederate officers of the time, he lost his citizenship, of course. But this was personally returned to him by President Johnson, and uh, with it, he was relieved of most of the burden from which at that time Confederate officers were suffering. After this period in his life, we begin to see the rise of his new and perhaps one of his most dynamic interests. In 1857, Albert Pike was coroneted as an honorary 33rd degree mason of the ancient and accepted Scottish rite of the southern jurisdiction. A year later he became an active member, which was a participating member. This might sound as though the general had come up in the world quite a bit, but in the time when he received this degree there were less than a thousand Scottish rite masons in the United States. It has been said of him that he found masonry in a log cabin and left it in a palace. Gradually, his interest in masonry increased. Later, when he was raised to the honor of the Supreme Grand Commander or Sovereign Grand Commander of the Scottish Rite of the Southern Jurisdiction, he devoted his life almost completely to Masonic research. Gradually, his interest centered more and more in Washington, and the closing years of his life were spent there. Uh, the uh, fact that he was raised to his highest Masonic honor uh, exactly 100 years ago 
has caused masonry throughout America and Europe to set aside a special celebration in honor of this circumstance. We may also point out that in the day of General Pike, Freemasonry, in particularly in its higher degrees, lacked most of the integration and sublimity with which modern Masonry has been enriched. Therefore, General Pike, in his great work, The Magnum Opus, which is not available to the public, uh, rewrote completely the rituals of the Scottish Rite from the 4th to the 32nd degree, and also made very definite provisions for the 33rd and last degree. Into this work which he did, uh, General Pike involved the total pattern of his scholarship. And these rites today are rich in philosophical values which would otherwise not be so apparent if present at all. In his scholarship, uh, General Pike was more or less a pioneer in America, inasmuch as he extended his work into fields comparatively unexplored. He devoted a great deal of time to the mastery of the Hebrew language and was able, therefore, to translate very large parts of the Zohar and the Talmud from the original. His manuscripts on these subjects and others are in the House of the Temple. Another side of his scholarship is that he was he completely translated from the Latin, the Roman law. This was an enormous undertaking and carried him into a very broad field of legal research. Uh, further than this, he became a master of the Zen language and translated the great religious classics of the Persians, particularly the Zend Avesta. He also went further than this in his attainment of a knowledge of Sanskrit and was therefore able to also leave in manuscript and partly published forms his translations of the Vedas and the great classical works of India. For a man constantly laboring, not only under restricted means, but under a tremendous load of responsibilities, we can see that he accomplished a great deal. There is a story told of him that while he was in Washington, where he used to love to sit by his window and watch his canary birds in their cages and smoke his very long pipe, which uh, unfortunately some of his successors attempted to smoke with very serious results, uh, news came that a very distinguished scholar from Europe with certain abstract problems in philology uh, was searching for an educated American Having visited nearly all of the universities, including the one that Pike did not get into, he was ready to leave and return to Europe because he had found no one whose knowledge was broad enough or deep enough to meet his needs. Therefore, at this time, someone suggested to him, have you ever gone down to Washington and talked to General Pike? He said he never had gone there. He had never heard of General Pike. And who was he? But he was finally convinced that a brief detour would not do him any great amount of harm, so he went down for an afternoon and spent six months. During this time, as he afterwards expressed it, he had found the educated American. Uh, Pike's personal memory went back a long ways to the time when, as a young man, he had shaken hands with the Marquis de Lafayette. His entire life, running from about 1809, to about 1891, therefore covers a very large part of our American scene during this period. He is remembered perhaps as he was photographed by the great Civil War photographer Brady in Washington as a very large man with a long black frock coat, white hair hanging in ringlets on his shoulders, and a full beard. He is said to have been exceedingly picturesque. On one occasion, while he was away on a trip, word was uh, received by his friends in Washington that General Pike had met a sudden and unfortunate death. It was the wrong Pike, but no one knew it at the time. So a celebration, a kind of a wake, was held for him by his intellectual cohorts of various kinds. And uh, just as the celebration was reaching its uh, height, General Pike walked in the door. 
fortunately, the doorbell was answered by an underling of some kind who explained to him quickly the situation. Pike said, do not say anything. Just take me into the next room where I can sit and listen while nice things are being said about me. <laughs> so he listened until he, he felt that he really had been duly honored, and then he made an appearance. Uh, this, uh, he said, was to his mind perfectly correct, and the anecdote is preserved under the title of The Wake of a Good Arkansas Gentleman. Pike's sense of humor in masonry, as well as his scholarship, has never been forgotten. There is an old legend, which probably is more true than otherwise, that when the time used to come for him to confer the 33rd degree upon some likely and proper candidate, he would get into a dashboard buggy with the candidate sitting on the back with his feet hanging over the uh, back of the wagon. Uh, they would then take enough supplies for a very pleasant and convivial time and ride out to a quiet spot along the Potomac. Uh, Pike would sit on one end of a log and the candidate, candidate on the other. And when the refreshments had been finished, the candidate had been duly raised. Uh, Pike's uh, attitudes on all things were not, only, were not only profound, but delightfully human. He had none of the heaviness of scholarship. He was a genial, pleasant, capable person. And uh, one of the last uh, things relating to him, perhaps, of interest, is on his deathbed in the last uh, few days of his life, the general was unable to speak. But shortly before his death, his friends noted that he moved his hand very quietly and very feebly to the wall alongside of his bed. And there he traced on the wall the Hebrew letter Shin. It was one of the last things that he ever did. By this word, by this character, he implied the word Shiloh, which means peace. And those are that was probably the last known important action which he performed. The general's attainments, therefore, divide into several groups. And in 1957, the Supreme Council, through its librarian, has prepared an outline of the works, writings, manuscripts, and papers of General Albert Pike. And through the courtesy of the House of the Temple, we have a copy of this. And we might note that although uh, about a dozen pages, or maybe 20, are devoted to various anecdotes and other material, the rest of the book is nothing but a classified listing of his work, running into hundreds of volumes so that he presents an interesting situation. Now this in itself might justify his inclusion in uh, a discussion of course such as we contemplate. But I think there are two other points that are very interesting and important. General Pike's scholarship was during his own time widely recognized. He was a man whose attainments in the fields of philosophy, comparative religion, and related subjects were outstanding, perhaps almost unique, possibly the only contemporary rival that he may have had was Professor Max Müller, the great German Orientalist. As a result of this unusual attainment, it has long seemed that his writings while in many instances related particularly to the subjects of Freemasonry with which he was most concerned, his writings extend far beyond this field, far beyond what might be termed uh, such material as is of exclusive Masonic interest. It enters into almost every department of knowledge. Therefore, it seems appropriate that he and his work should be remembered in the field of general philosophy in the field of comparative religion and in all other fields in which his remarkable achievements have lasting value. It is a pity that works which are basic, which represent the highest levels of personal scholarship, uh, should be neglected merely because they have been associated with a fraternity. The works stand completely on their own, and as such, we wish to uh, discuss them and to a measure the philosophical attitudes and principles 
uh, which General Pike not only believed and taught but exemplified in his own conduct. So with these preambling remarks, perhaps we can go to the subject of the evening, uh, which cuts across both Masonic and non-Masonic fields, because it certainly belongs very closely to the study of comparative religion, and as such, uh, to the interests that we all have. Among the lesser known writings of General Pike, in addition to his principal text, Morals and Dogma, are his lectures on Masonic symbolism, uh, which are limited in addition to a hundred copies of each work. Uh, one of these lectures, or one of these works, is devoted to the analysis of the Omkara, or the sacred name. And uh, as it is touched upon also in Morals and Dogma, and also in another work of Pike, the Sefa Hedibran, it seems that it might be an interesting point with which to open our general consideration of his philosophy. Naturally, Pike was convinced, as most students today are, that there were in antiquity, not only in the Western nations but also in the Eastern nations, schools of esoteric philosophy schools which prescribed certain profound and particular disciplines for the cultivation of man's internal life. These schools were the mysteries, and they were cherished and respected and honored in India, China, Greece, Egypt, and even into the Roman Empire. These schools, taught by a series of symbolic processes, causing the individual to grow or unfold by a process of intuiting uh, from emblems, symbols, allegories, fables, and parables. In the beginning, therefore, General Pike want, uh, wants to point out that the language of the mysteries was never a literal tongue. Not because perhaps men wish to conceal, but because those things which men most desire to know cannot be communicated with words. Man cannot merely be told a truth greater than his own capacity to understand. Therefore, the only way in which that can be imparted, for which there is not already an available content of understanding is by means of symbols. Symbols are important because they cause the individual to increase his own understanding by the contemplation of them. They cause him to draw out from himself a background or a subconscious power to know which he has not as yet uh, advanced in a factual or objective manner. Therefore, symbols teach by persuasion. They introduce, they excite, they stimulate, they challenge. They are like the child's riddle. They cause the individual to desperately, in one way or another, seek to understand them. He feels himself frustrated by his own ignorance. He cannot con allow this condition to continue. So instead of merely seeing and forgetting, he sees and examines. By examination, his attention is focused. By this attention, his concentration is stimulated. By concentration, in turn, his insight is strengthened. And he begins to search in himself for any shreds, any fragments, any parts of things previously known which can have a bearing upon this new mystery. And first of all, he discovers that there is more knowledge in himself than he has suspected. He discovers that by uniting all his resources, he can grope forward toward a more adequate explanation of the thing which he seeks to know. 
This is good Orientalism in basic principle. It is the problem that lies behind the vast image pageantry of Asia. If the person is without imagination, if he is without desire for insight, if he is not in any way stimulated beyond the obvious, then the symbol remains a locked and literal mystery. But as he says, General Pike says in his work, the great heritage of masonry, and in this he refers also uh, by a broader meaning to any symbol that has descended within a body of philosophy or religion, that the great heritage lies in these emblems, in these figures, which meant something, which inspired and guided, and which were left as landmarks for those who came after inviting the individual not merely to listen, but to search, but to quest in himself for the meanings locked within the symbols. A good symbol, therefore, a great symbol, is not immediately exhaustible. In fact, it may not be even remotely exhaustible. It is something that continues to mean more as we become capable of understanding more. Therefore, we can go back over the book of symbols, and each time we read it, or look through it, or scan it, uh, we bring to bear upon it the latest acquirements of our own consciousness. So the symbol is forever unfolding like a flower, not because it changes in its own nature, but because our nature's changing are reflected upon the surface of the device or emblem. This type of thinking to a great degree, explained uh, General Pike's revision of the rights of the Scottish degrees. Uh, he enriched their symbolism, <coughs> fully aware that this symbolism had a certain censorship over itself. There would be some who would see. There would be others who would not see. There would some be some who would accept one interpretation, suitable to their immediate need. Others would accept another interpretation because of greater insight of their own. But man, by the very nature of him, can never totally un outgrow the symbol because it continues to unfold as he grows, uh, actually almost to infinity. He is always finding more in the symbol because there is more in himself. This is a key, perhaps, to a great many things. It seems to me, for example, that it is a very good key to Holy Scriptures. For we know how frequently and wonderfully these works are quoted. Each person will quote them to support his own immediate interpretation. But as he changes, the interpretations change. And in the United States alone, the Christian Bible is subject to more than 500 principal interpretations, each derived from the same text but each revealing a different degree of insight, a different degree of personal reaction uh, to idea and to the content behind parables, allegories, and phrases. Thus it is that the symbolical or emblematic form of instruction, based to a degree upon the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphical method, constitutes the kind of education that the word education itself implies from educo, meaning to draw forth or to bring out of the individual that which is in himself. This is one of the basic principles upon which Pike developed his entire wealth of symbolism, deriving it from innumerable ancient sources, bringing it together into magnificent dramatic patterns, weaving these elements into a rich tapestry for the contemplation of those so minded. Also, as those of us realize who have worked even with tapestries as such, there can be a long association with a great product of the Goblin uh, tapestry factories. And each time we look at the magnificent work, we see something new. And this ability to forever see something new uh, it takes us away from the prosaic, and once more, and particularly, it takes us away from the dogmatic. A symbol is not a dogma. A symbol does not say to you, thus you shall believe. 
or that you shall deny. A symbol does not force upon you an incomprehensible meaning, nor does it bind you to a decadent one. It is constantly new. It constantly binds you only to your immediate apperceptive power. The symbol means what it means to you now, regardless of what it meant to the ancients or may mean to the unborn future. Thus this becomes a tremendous method, a tremendous scientific procedure for the enrichment of man and the increase of his knowledge. Now among the symbols that have had particular interest to us for a very long time has been that which deals with the sacred name of deity. And this particular symbolism, as Pike observes, is almost universally diffused. Among the most primitive peoples, there are certain taboos and restrictions upon the pronouncing of the name of God. Uh, these restrictions are to be pre frequently found in the early Jewish metaphysics relating to the Old Testament, uh, where the name of deity was not permitted to be used, and wherever it occurred in the sacred scriptures, another word or another name, Adonai, was given in order that the sacred name might not be spoken. Even when the Masoretic points were added, these points were the ones taken from another word, so that still the original pronunciation of the divine name was concealed. The uh, Egyptian myth or legend of Ishtar commanding Re, the sun deity, to reveal his secret name is another example of the same. In Africa, each native is given a secret name, and any person who is able to possess that name possesses the soul of the man. These legends go very far back. We find them among the American Indians, and we find them also in India and in China and in Japan, and the concept not only extends to Hinduism and Persian philosophy, but also descends into Buddhism and uh, continues down to our present time. In the book of Revelation, for example, it is stated that the person who overcomes or is successful under the trials will be given a new name or a secret name written upon the broken halves of a stone, a white stone. The parts of the stone are then rejoined and bound together so that no one may know the name except the one to whom it is given. In the early Egyptian rite, for example, in the cultural history of Egypt, each Egyptian was given two names. One was his milk name, which was given to him at birth, his child name. When he reached maturity, he was given a temple name, a name which was said to have been calculated for him by the priests to exemplify particularly his own deepest and most valuable attributes or qualities. It is uh, common, of course, also uh, that the giving up or the casting away of a name has an important meaning. In the ancient times, for instance, the idea of name had to do with a kind of identity. The individual and his name, more or less, were in sympathetic spiritual relationship to each other. The name, therefore, was the person. The person in turn was the name. If therefore an individual uh, decided to change his way of life, he might very well change his name. And this was especially true in connection with the monastic orders of Europe. Wherever a person entered priesthood or became a monk or a nun, they took a different name. They gave up their earth name. They gave up their mortal name and usually took the name of a saint or some sanctified person. By this was the final, uh, we shall say, renunciation of self. To give up the name was to give up self, to give up identity, uh, to cease all egoism or to cease all emphasis upon uh, selfness or the importance of an individual or personal career or outlook toward life. These practices, widely diffused and continuing among many peoples even to the present time, 
undoubtedly originated in a very ancient system of culture. In the New Testament, we are told uh, that there is a peculiar malediction, a peculiar uh, curse to be raised against any person who shall change a name or a word of the text. That uh, even in this sense, translation is a violation of this original concept. Now, some will assume, for instance, that this means only uh, a great piety or orthodoxy or perhaps some magical overtone. But such apparently was not the original intention. The concept seems to be the same as that expounded by Pythagoras of Samos. In other words, the name becomes a curious key to the thing named. By this I mean that nearly every name uh, indicates the principle, the situation, the condition, the factor which the word itself has been applied to. Thus, for example, in the Old Testament, the name of Moses is something which contains within it a Kabbalah, a secret meaning. And those possessing the knowledge of the art may take from the name the true meaning of the thing represented by the symbol. Thus, the true identity of this person who we know was not actually named Moses, but to whom this name was given, the identity is concealed in the name. The same was true of Pythagoras himself. He pointed out that his own name, Pythagoras, was the master key to his entire system of instruction. If, therefore, this name was taken out of its original language so that it could no longer uh, be analyzed by the mathematical philosophy involved in that language with the correspondences between numbers and letters, between mathematical formulas and the shapes and structures of letters, if these were changed, then the key to meaning was lost. For that reason, it was always held that the name was most important, that the name was the immediate landmark by means of which a mystery concealed beneath a name could be uh, quickly uh, discerned. And the entire statement or the symbolic pattern involved with the name could be reorganized, changed, and directed into the full statement of its true meaning. This situation we find uh, frequently in classical literature, where the names of the Greek gods, the names of the Egyptian deities, the names of the Hindu deities, the names of the Chinese divinities, all these are not merely personal names. They are philosophical formulas by means of which a new dimension of understanding is possible. And in each one of the countries involved, including China, India, and Arabia, there are definite arts or sciences by means of which these names uh, can be uh, opened. There is a key to them, the key which turns seven times in the lock the key which twisting back and forth in an involved combination formula results, for example, in the unfoldment, perhaps, of an entire text out of one name. This type of thinking is unfamiliar to us, and we probably have more or less neglected to develop it. At the same time, we know the ancient did and the principles of it are preserved in the Kabbalah under the Notoricon and Gematria, the ways of breaking open names or words, and through the study of them to correct errors which might otherwise creep into uh, our thinking and our philosophy. General Pike points out uh, that deities of various levels nearly always have peculiar word combinations involving certain specific and definite numbers of letters. 
the great Jesuit priest scholar Athanasius Kirchhoff developed what he called his design of the 72 names of deity. These 72 names are all composed of four letters and represent an almost universal diversity of roots. That the number four, therefore, had a particular and peculiar significance in relationship to certain deities, we have to remember. We must also remember that the number three is also carefully and definitely associated with another order of divinities, and the number seven with and still a different order. We also realize that Irenaeus in his discussion of the Gnostics uh, points out this mysterious being, a creature devised symbolically, a kind of diagrammatic person upon whose body uh, the letters of the alphabet were completely distributed throughout the body. Pythagoras tells us, for example, that in the pronunciation of the word Pythagoras, it is necessary for the mind to energize a series of levels of sound, that these sounds in turn have forms, that these forms in turn are the bases of ideas and that in the mere pronunciation of these names, such as the name of Pythagoras, a tremendous vibratory circumstance occurs within the constitution of the individual. In the Gnostic symbolism, we have the seven-rayed lion deity, the lion-headed uh, Mithras. In the round, the head of this deity are placed the seven vowels, and the name of the deity is composed of these vowels. Now we also find, in relation to the same Gnostic mystery in the concept of the Christos, we find the statement, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. When in the case of the Gnosis, the central letter is added, then we find in the Gnostics their form of the ineffable name consisting of the vowels A, I, and O. Now this A, I, O combination, reversed, rearranged, inverted, returns in a great many ancient languages because it represents certain primary sounds. These sounds in turn having to do with the essential nature of deity. In the East Indian philosophy, we have a word that is generally translated in, or transliterated into the letters O-M. This word, however, in the original actually consists of three letters, although in the sounding and arranging of them this has been more or less neglected. More correctly, perhaps, if we wanted to transliterate, we would come upon A-O-M or A-U-M because of the structure of language. Now, as you also know, in the ancient languages, U and V were interchangeable. And uh, even in early English, this is true. Even as late as the Elizabethan period, the U and V form and the W were interchangeable. So AUM, AOM, or AVM, uh, stand together to represent something. These, the symbol for which, uh, the principle for which the symbol stands is that of the Supreme Being. Yet the Supreme Being is not merely indicated by what has been termed a monosyllable, but what is really two and one half syllables. It's a very peculiar structural form. But now when the Hindu approaches this, uh, this subject, he tells us, for example, that these three letters uh, become the first letters of three words. Uh, that A stands for Agni, the principle of fire. That the U, V, or O, for which are interchangeable, stands for Varuna, which is the principle of water. And the M stands for the Mahuts, or the principle of air. 
Therefore, we have these three uh, letters standing for three elements, fire, water, and air. Now, for instance, in your hermetic rites, fire is calculated or held under the name herm, uh, which means flame. Therefore, your deity or your great teacher, Hermes, represents the principle of fire. Now, in the same uh, concept, for instance, uh, we have another symbol which has occurred in your alchemical situation, and that is the deity or goddess Aphroditus or Aphrodite, the principle of water. If, therefore, in the alchemical process you marry fire, which is Hermes, to Aphrodite, which is uh, water, or you achieve the marriage of the sun and moon, you produce what is called in alchemy the hermaphrodite, the Hermes Aphroditus, which means the fire, water, the male, female, God, nature, heaven, earth. And uh, the words themselves become of great importance to us. Now in the ancient uh, legend of the building of Solomon's temple, uh, we uh, find in the Bible that a very cunning workman by the name of Hiram was brought to assist in the development of the temple ornamentations and artifacts. Now here is one of the interesting examples of what happens when we make a mistake. In the ancient language, uh, the Hebrew letter H and CH are almost identical. The only difference is that in the CH a stroke is slightly separated from another stroke, which is, uh, uh, which, uh, pardon me, in the H the stroke is separated and in the CH it is not. The figures are identically the same in general appearance. Therefore the term Hiram has come out of a CH R-I, instead of an H-I-R. Thus we have Kuram, Hiram, instead of Hiram. Now when we take it in this form, we have C-H, R, and M. We have the three letters of the, of the language. We have the Chet, the Resh, and the Mem, which mean fire, air, and water. And we are exactly back to our AUM in India. Therefore, we must search for something which justifies this. We must seek, if we can, to find out why uh, this CH or the fire symbol was used in connection with this person. We know that he was a cunning workman in metals, and we also know that fire is the only element that will work metals so that it has to be fire. But this is the hermetic fire, the fire of the mysteries, the fire of transmutation, the fire of regeneration, the fire which tempers steel, the fire which takes base metals and fuses them, permitting them to be worked. And under this fire we therefore have an appropriate symbol of the creating power and the great religions of antiquity, of course, included in ancient times the worship of fire, the worship of the principle of life as fire. In the Indian system, East Indian system, therefore, our sacred name contains the roots of the three powers, the three basic qualities by means of which earth is moved. We may say, therefore, that fire represents spiritual content, that water represents psychical content or content, and air represents intellectual content. We come, therefore, further into the idea of a triad composed of spirit, soul, and mind. We further find that the fourth element is always left out, the element of earth. 
Therefore, we have a quaternary consisting of three agents operating upon a fourth power or principle. Thus, by such analysis, we can begin to apply uh, the meaning of certain words, using them as methods for the discovery of valid principles concealed beneath words. Why in the ancient rituals and symbolism should the name of deity uh, be regarded with such peculiar veneration and to be regarded also as something that must not be revealed? In ancient times and in the Mithraic rites of the Persians, the name was also used in connection with the altar as a symbol of the veil. The name was the link between the deity or the being defined and the one defining. Thus man, approaching deity, approaches first the name of deity. This is the sacred name composed of flames that was said to have covered the face of the Ancient of Ancients in the old Kabbalistic legends. Those seeking to penetrate the mystery of God were first of all faced by what were called the army of the name, which is a very interesting thing. It returns to us again in Egypt, the army of the name. This army formed the god of honor. It protected the substance or the subject of the thing named from profanation. You could not escape from the facing of the name. Wherever you turned, uh, you were confronted not with the thing itself, but with its likeness or appearance. Therefore, Paracelsus also tells us that nature is a divine writing, and that every form that we see around us is a kind of symbolic alphabet, or element of a symbolic alphabet. That all things together spell out things, and that this spelling out forms words, forms patterns, and makes available ideas. Actually, however, name now in the Hindu philosophy becomes a very important thing in itself. Actually, in the Hindu system, and also in the Persian Avestan system, in which the whom, H-U-M, appears as a prominent factor, the name becomes both the cognizable and the knowable aspect of something in itself unknowable. We may speak the name without knowing the nature. Therefore, name and nature are not, in philosophical mysteries, entirely identical. We may remember the words of, the, of Van Dyck, who names it, shall never find it. And for the one who finds it, it needs no name. Thus name becomes, in a sense, a veil. It is the army of letters that conceals the truth. And the individual who is content to accept the name will never possess the fact. Socrates gives us this same priceless bit of information in another way, in which he discourses with his disciples concerning the difference between name and nature. He asks the disciple what a certain thing is, and for example, we will say that the disciple says, Master, this is a carrot. So the master said, fine, that is what it is. Uh, now what is a carrot? Well, a carrot master is a vegetable. Uh, well, if it's a vegetable, what kind of a vegetable is this? And the disciple says, Master, this is a carrot. And by that time, Socrates smilingly says, Yes, and now my ignorance is complete. <laughs> Yet how many of us have been accustomed to name substitution for idea? There is scarcely an idea that we possess that hasn't died in the naming. There is practically no principle which we seek in which our desire to discover is not satisfied merely by name. Instead of searching for idea content, 
we call things by names that have been given to them. True, if we are to believe Genesis, these things were named according to their natures. But their natures are concealed in the names, only by the matria. To discover the meaning, we must penetrate the veil, or the name. Therefore, in the mysteries, the name was emblazoned upon the gate of the sanctuary. But it was, a, it was so emblazoned as to be undecipherable, concealed in some symbolic form that might not easily be captured or known. It identified the house of the God, but it did not reveal the God. In the same way, nature, as the great name, identifies the house of cause or the house of principle but it does not reveal the principle it shows us a series of symbolic depictions of principle but as long as we are willing to accept the shadow for the substance the name for the thing named we are in a desperate situation of ignorance here is where modern semantics is stepping in in an effort to relieve us from the burden of name we name a person, and yet in naming them, we accept them without knowing them. Yet we regard the fact that we possess their name as important. We know or believe that if we can call a person by his right name, he is a friend. If we call him by his first name, he is an intimate friend or a relative. But called by any name, he remains unknown. For actually, the name is never as far as our thinking is concerned, enough to provide us with the substance for which that name stands. The name, therefore, is applied to a being, a condition, a situation, or a fact. Yet by this we have only the stimulation of a general identificational orientation. We do not have the substance. This furthermore points out the danger of the total substitution of the spoken word for idea. It reminds us that the essential facts we desire can never be communicated by word alone, and also reminds us, as the Greek pointed out, that we have come into the sovereign difficulty of all. We now have come to think with words. This is a very important thing. When an idea comes to us today, even out of ourselves, this idea, before it is even concreted, is expressed in our own consciousness by a name. We give it a name before we have even formulated it. We think with words. And because words have sunk into us from a great many association factors, they have become like tiny blocks with which we attempt to build up ideas. Therefore we array a word against a word and believe that we are toying with ideas, which we are not. We have never permitted ideas to have the freedom from the word. Through the gateway of the word to discover, if possible, the substance behind this elusive, shadowy form. Another strange thing about words is that, like all other symbols, they are not identical in meaning to different persons. And the same word spoken by one to another will have a different meaning if spoken by that other to still another. Words, therefore, are not adequate for the transmission of idea. They merely permit us to pass and exchange and barter certain common goods. But as we go deeper into meaning, we have to find another method of communication. Uh, Dr. Breasted, the University of Chicago, pointed out that it was his opinion that when Champollion broke the Egyptian hieroglyphs, giving us, the, for the first time, the a power to read this language, which had been locked for a long time, probably better than 1,800 years, that actually this breaking down of the barrier through the Rosetta Stone was not what had been hoped. He was convinced, Dr. Preston, that the Egyptians had two complete languages which they held together by one set of hieroglyphs. 
They had a language for the preservation of ordinary knowledge. And they had a sacerdotal language in which they used the same glyphs with a totally different meaning. That the outer form and the inner form were only apparently the same. The priest, therefore, could write in the common character. And the reader would come to some common knowledge, but not the original meaning, which only another person of the same understanding as the writer could actually comprehend. In Europe, this same procedure drifted into ciphers, in which sudden or secret meanings were concealed within familiar word patterns and could only be discovered by those possessing the key to the decoding of the cipher. Thus, we have a whole group of factors involved in this concept of words and their relation to religion and philosophy. Ultimately, this means that the exhaustion of idea in, its, in philosophy requires a far greater knowledge of language and of words than we have realized. This implies, then, that ultimately language will have to move into the philosophic group because only when we have this knowledge uh, can we rapidly advance certain ends which will otherwise remain obscure. For example, in the New Testament we are inclined to think that the stoning of Stephen marked the first martyr of Christianity. That uh, Stephen, who has since had a very important place, was a person's name. Actually, this is not the case. If there was this man and he was stoned, unfortunately we do not know his name. Because to the student of language it becomes immediately obvious that Stephen could not be his name. Because Stephen comes from Stephani, mean which means a winner in a public competition. This man had either been a winner in the games or in some rhetorical competition. He had been crowned with the Stephanic crown. Therefore, he had the distinction of having been so honored. The fact that he was so honored has been forgotten, and now it is presumed that his honor is his name. Another example is the uh, famous mystery surrounding the identity of Melchizedek, king of Salem. We are not at all sure who or what this Melchizedek may be because the name doesn't tell us. It is not a name at all. It merely tells us that this man was a priest of Zedek, that he was therefore a priest of an ancient deity. And we have, must search in the mysteries and the rituals and the symbolisms of the cult of Zedek for the things we have now merely summarized together under the name of a man. That uh, this uh, follows through is also into the second part, because he was king of Salem. Now we, of course, think of Salem inevitably as a place, but Salem means simply peace. He was a prince of peace. He was a holy man. And the fact that he was or was not from any community has no value in the decoding of the thing for which he stands, a point which is still locked scholars because they have tried to make these things appear historical. That there may have been such a priest we do not deny, but the, the importance of him and his place in the scripture deals with an entirely different subject. Also we find uh, a point which I think uh, is maybe worth mentioning in this respect, the habit that has long uh, survived of identifying the deities of one faith with the evil geniuses of another. Whenever a faith has been overthrown by its adversary and another religion has taken its place, the old gods have been slowly but inevitably transformed into demons. So in medieval demonology we have a whole group of evil spirits, prince of darkness, princes of darkness, all of them derived in some way from honorable terms of another faith. For instance, when we uh, wish to think of utter and complete uh, confusion, we perhaps will follow uh, the thinking of Milton in his Paradise Lost, 
where he makes the evil spirits to abide in pandemonium. Now the word pandemonium is derived from the word pan, which was the nature deity of the ancient Latins and uh, Greeks and to a measure of the North African Egyptians. Pan, the, word, the basic term of our word panic also, and also of our, of our prefix pan, pan-American, pan-Pacific, simply means in the sense of spreading over all, or covering all, or including many things. Pan-America would be all the Americas considered together, and Pan was the god of all nature. But uh, he had the body, supposedly, of a goat with hoofs and the horns of a ram or goat, and he grad gradually got transformed into our traditional devil, simply because he was no longer fashionable. Another good example is Beelzebub, prince of devils. He is Baal-zebub, my lord who sings, one of the highest and most important good deities of the Babylonians. Each one of these terms has thus gotten into trouble. The daemon of Socrates became the demon of medieval theology, quite a different meaning entirely. Uh, but the attendant guides and guardians of one became the tutelary infernal spirits of another. And our name Lucifer from Lux Pharaoh simply means the bearer of light and has nothing to do with the uh, connotations now associated with it. Thus, uh, names uh, have again been perverted for various purposes and uses. And about this we must sometime stop and give pause and thought. The Mithraic rites of Persia, uh, following the older Zoroastrian and Zarathustran cult, uh, developed around the mystery of the ineffable name, the symbol of life. In the Egyptian mysteries, uh, the supreme power of life was represented by the Croix Sanseta, or the Ansated Cross, a cross in the form of a T with a loop above the center of it. The unsated cross was the original nilometer, uh, a device used by the Egyptians in estimating the inundation of the Nile. If the river failed to raise sufficiently to cause the cross to be formed by the meeting of the beams, there was not enough water to ensure the crop, and therefore uh, there was no life, there was not salvation. This symbol later became a concealing form for the word or the ineffable name itself and is shown uh, issuing from the mouth of Ramesses the Great uh, on the carvings and the little cross comes out of his mouth at the time when he spares the life of an enemy or pardons uh, a criminal or something of that nature. It is a sign of forgiveness or the return of life, the re-bestowing of life. In ancient times, the life principle, uh, as General Pite uh, points out in his interpretations of the Zohar, the life principle was also associated with the concept of generation, which means to give life. Therefore, in the earliest symbolism, the ineffable name or power is associated also with the concept of the generative force of nature or of the universe. And in its earliest forms, we still find traces, therefore, of the old agrarian cults, and we find forms and traces of primitive phallic worship, or the worship of the principle of generation. One of the most sophisticated and highly evolved of all these great systems of thinking comes to us, of course, uh, through the Hindu. And today we are most likely to contact the Omkara, or sacred name, in the teachings of yoga, Vedanta, or perhaps Northern Buddhism. In these systems, the name plays a comparatively vital part because it is said to possess certain power. And the methods for the pronunciation of the name are held to be of the highest sacredness. In the uh, great concept of the Jadat Gurus, uh, the master presents the mystery of the name to his successor prior to 
the departure of the master uh, for out of this life or into permanent retreat in some place where he's no longer to contact the world. The passing of the name, the passing in this case of the mystery of the vibratory significance of the Omkara formula is held to be the supreme indication of enlightenment. Of course, the moment you approach this in the Eastern way, you come upon a series of very interesting but confusing symbols. In the first place, from the older writings, we know that the word now known as the ineffable was originally not regarded as in any way secret or mysterious in itself. Most of the Vedic hymns and the great prayers of the Rig Veda particularly uh, open and close with this word. And there is no doubt that by derivation and by extension we will find that it lies behind the use of the word Amen in connection with our own uh, religious observances. Amen, of course, being derived directly from the Egyptian, but uh, indirectly from Asia. Amen being the name of a deity, rather than a salutation or a statement of uh, respect, veneration, or a closing or terminating of a sacred session. The uh, Amen, of course, is supposed to divide sacred from profane utterances or concerns and is to separate our common speech from any speech related to holy matters. In the um, use of the Ankara formula, therefore, it was not actually the word itself that was sacred. It was the use of it, what it stood for, and how the understanding of it was to be applied. In the ancient times then this word which was devised, divided into three essential parts or two complete parts and a half part a time a time and a half time uh, which we find referred to in sacred writings having to do with this particular problem the Omkara is first of all a symbol of a total concept and I'm going to draw from an entirely different source for just a moment because I want to clarify a symbolism by means of reference uh, to the Japanese system of flower arrangement in the Ikenobo style the formal flower arrangement formula all of the elements of design are reduced to three and these three are referred to in the older text as the blossom, the bud, and the leaf. Now, the leaf and the blossom are a time and a time, and the bud is a half a time. There is again a mathematical formula because the bud is not yet complete. It is only a part. Through the combination of these three factors, the leaf, the blossom, and the bud. An infinite diversity of symbolic arrangements can be produced, each of these arrangements testifying to a total fact, a total or complete uh, experience or a reality. When the Ikenobo master has completed his basic flower arrangement, he will probably not any longer leave merely these three. He will extend them as Pythagoras extended the principal points of the Tetractus, which are the three points of the upper part of the pyramid of ten dots. These three are the roots. And in the Ikenobo system, again we have the three and the seven making ten. <coughs> For the master of the flower arrangement, having prepared or placed his three elements, will then involve these elements with seven secondary combinations. These seven combinations apparently obscuring the three or hiding them. A reminder that in ancient times it was assumed that there were 
actually seven vowels but in the development of the science of the sacred name only three of those vowels are ever used the others are not used relating as they do to a less sacred matter and in the ancient Hebrew language there were only three vowels and seven consonants which is said to be the reason why our ancient Hebrew friends early developed the tendency to talk with their hands there being not enough letters or words available to them and it was only after ages in which the language became sufficiently rich uh, for it no longer to be actually necessary to use a kind of diagrammatic use of hands gesture and motion which incidentally also occurs in your mudras of India of which there are three and seven essential groups or patterns now when your flower arrangement is complete and you contemplate it you then begin the process of the gradual acceptance of a supreme mathematical formula a formula that moves through everything a formula which according to both Hinduism and Buddhism has been stamped upon the whole face of the universe therefore your flower arrangement in its little bowl rises from rocks which represent the earth or the fourth principle unnamed and it rises in the form of three living things each of a different length each with a different relationship and these in turn unfolded or enclosed by additional lines mathematically derived from the I Ching or the trigrams of the Chinese by means of which ultimately a total design is invoked or brought into existence if you study these three arrangements therefore you can also turn to oriental art which is based upon your flower arrangement formula here you observe that your picture always consists of three parts heaven earth and man you find that the entire relationship is therefore factually mind body and person mind body and person indicates for example that a mysterious loom is set up the monocordia mundi of Pythagoras a mysterious bridge is used to span between mind and matter and this bridge that spans this interval produces a series of factors which ultimately cause what we call man therefore heaven is the flower or mind is the flower body is the leaf because it does not bear fruit and the bud is man who is the potential God and from whose growth must ultimately unfold the entire mystery in the Buddhist lotus which is often used in the same symbolism the lotus becomes the living symbol of the ineffable word it becomes so because its roots are in the earth its stem passes up through the element of, of water its surface and its blossom break forth into air and its face is turned upward and nourished forever by the light of the fire of the Sun therefore it ascends through the elements or qualities and in so doing tells us uh, the essential pattern of life in uh, oriental art also every pattern must in some way be triangulated uh, there must be in every perfect design the essential symbols involved in the great concept of the word for all these things are pictures of a kind of word thus you will find some very simple and uh, conventional design you will find a mountain on a painting you will find a representation of a mountain and at the foot of the mountain forests and in the midst of the forest a stream flowing and by the side of the bank of the stream an old man fishing now, there is a complete statement of the omkara or the sacred word 
The mountains, the sky, the great distances represent heaven. Uh, the water and the earth below and the forest represent the element of earth. And always between them, in some relation, is placed man. Either fishing in the waters of life, or contemplating, or in some way taking his sustenance from nature, but separated from it. Sometimes this old man may be riding a horse, or a buffalo, or some creature, to indicate again that man rides upon his body, which is another fact, and by his body is bound to the element of earth below. Uh, you will also sometimes see a rather interesting thing, and that is an old gentleman uh, riding upon some kind of a creature and bearing in his hand a scepter, or a long pole surmounted by a tassel of some kind. The scepter, if you examine it in the Chinese art, is always composed of clouds, the cloud scepter. Therefore, here we have again the triangle, the oxen, the man, and the cloud scepter, heaven, the scepter, earth, the ox, man riding between. Always the return of this triangulation. Now, apart from the symbolism, either in flower arrangement or in art, statuary, or in architecture, where it frequently and almost inevitably occurs, like the triple dome of the Temple of Heaven in Peking, or in the triple-headed uh, Brahma in the Trimuta Cave in, in uh, the harbor of Bombay, always this triangulation means something. It means the intimate experience of the relationship of all that exists. Now, how is this uh, sacred monosyllable therefore to be pronounced. And according to the, uh, the great northern system, which has to do with the turning of the wheel of the law, the great Dhamma Chakra, the word is spoken not by sound, not by lip, uh, not in any of these words, or in, in these ways. It is spoken by a process of internal visualization. Actually, the thundering of names, either before the temple or on the street, cannot produce the solution to the mystery. The thing must be spoken out of an experience of some nature. It must be derived, as the mudra and posture is also an unspoken language. But the mudra is not merely a means of conveying. The mudra is a means of experiencing within the self by controlling and directing motion. It is all much more subtle than we might at first imagine. So let us see now what uh, we have here uh, in our pattern of either the flower arrangement or the painting or the three letters which can be placed side by side or one above the other. If we place them one above the other or in a hieroglyphical pattern attempting a totality, let's see what the three letters stand for. If the three letters do begin with the principle of Agni, pass from Agni to Varuna and from Varuna to the Mahats, what are they actually telling us? They are telling us that illumination or the total spiritual experience of man is dependent upon the interrelationship of three factors. The first of these factors, the fire principle, is man's own consciousness. The second of these factors, in this case the air principle, has to do with environment. Air is the frame in the Zen philosophy, the frame upon the great picture of all things. In other words, air is associated in philosophy with the concept of the not-self. Air is a mutable factor, invisible in its own nature, and made visible only when it moves things. If you were in a vacuum and air struck you, you would not be aware of its existence. But you might know there was wind if you saw a tree in the distance moving. 
Therefore, air itself is invisible, but is a cause of motion. Air, then, represents the total concept of illusion, the not-self, phenomenon, fire of noumenon. These two are heaven and earth, heaven being the transcendent self, earth being the transitory not-self. Now, between these two, stands man, symbolized by Pythagoras and all other teachers of importance, by the number five. The number five, the pentagram, or the five-pointed star, in esoteric philosophy corresponds to the five sensory powers of man, which form, so to say, the bridge between heaven and earth. Therefore, we have internal consciousness, external, the object of consciousness, or environment. And between these two, the bridge of knowing, the bridge of communication, represented perhaps by a little boat floating upon an ocean or upon a river. Thus we have the thing cognizing, the thing to be cognized, and the instrument of cognition. If the instrument of cognition is destroyed in man, man no longer cognizes. If he loses his sight, he is no longer able uh, to see, even though in consciousness he may possess the power to see. The instrument or the media, therefore, is essential to the existence of the function or the process of a thing happening. But Indian philosophy is not concerned only with this, but with an important development of this theme. So let us say uh, for the moment that we now have the blossom, consciousness, the leaf, the object of consciousness, the bud, the unfolding means of consciousness, representing again the A, the U, and the M, because the U was anciently a hook and represented a binder, something that connects two separate things together. And as the hook or the, uh, the cant hook, it is a symbol of man as the binder between two things. If, therefore, we begin the contemplation of yoga or Vedanta, what happens? You have often heard the expression that the individual on a certain occasion being greatly concerned in something or with something lost himself in his work. You may have used the term with some uh, frequency on one occasion. A man says, I am lost in reverie. I am lost in contemplation. What he is telling you is, I am is lost. That is what he is actually telling you. He is telling you, for example, that under the condition of an intensity, his entire energy quotient is directed away from himself and towards something, or is immersed in something. The nagging parent, complaining constantly over the difficulties of the occasion, suddenly hears the cry of a sick child. Instantly the problem vanishes. The nagging vanishes. The self-equation vanishes. And the individual becomes lost in the significance of that cry. We go to the motion picture. We sit in a seat, some distance from the stage, with bobbing heads in front of us. Uh, we are looking upon a shadow uh, cast upon a screen. We know that our favorite star's face, as we look at it in a close-up, has a mouth nine or ten feet wide, perhaps, and that also that this face is large enough to fill a barn door. We realize that the whole thing is projected by a piece of machinery, that there is no one there except a sound device and a shadow. And yet after five minutes, how many of you are aware of that? In a very few seconds, you become lost in the theme, if the picture is worth seeing. If you are aware of the details, you should get up and leave. The picture is not for you. And nowadays, people frequently do that. 
But in a very brief time, all of the peculiar stenographic shortcuts of theatrical production are forgotten. You find it perfectly possible to make a transition of years in a few seconds. You find people moving in and out of rooms without the common courtesy of opening doors. It doesn't bother you in the slightest. You have accepted. And while you are watching the picture, what has happened to you? Where are you? You have attained merely the position or condition of the perceiver. You are not aware that you are the perceiver. You are not aware that you exist. You are simply an area of cognition. If the picture is any good, you may forget even for a moment some aches and pains that have annoyed you. You forget the fact that taxes are due. You forget the fact you have just had a religious argument with a friend. These things cease. Why? Because you, as a center of personal integration, you have ceased. You will come back the moment the scene changes, or the picture ends, or the commercials begin. But even on the little screen of a television set, you can still, to a measure, attain the same illusion. You become identified with object, and lose identity of subject. Now, actually, this is the phenomenon upon which the complete concept of samadhi has been developed in Eastern thinking. It is also the concept that underlies the paranirvana of the Buddha. Cognition without self. In other words, the pronunciation or the envisioning of the power of the sacred name, and it is frequently represented on a mandala by a design, or by a formula of letters, uh, as in the case of certain of the Japanese sects, particularly Nichiren. In the Nichiren Shu, the entire formula of salvation is an elaborate, fantastic design of letters, through the contemplation of which the individual attains illumination. What is the illumination, then? The illumination is cognition without self. It is the complete disassociation of the individual with his own center of awareness. This presents the great problem. This is why in the Indian concept it is usual to place the omkara or the sacred monosyllable or the mysterious character which is composed of parts but appears to be one within a radiant aureole of some kind, rays pouring from it. Sometimes it is placed in the face of the sun. Sometimes it is placed in a cup consisting of the union of the sun and moon, and as particularly relating to the thousand petal chakra in the brain. Sometimes it is placed upon the open pedestal of a lotus flower. Again, the lotus flower or the blossom representing by its unfolding the revelation of the Omkara, or the divine name. Man seeking for the experience of the name must therefore attempt to define the nature of that consciousness by which he perceives and without which, and with which at the same time he is without perception of his own existence. Now this is a very fine point, yet while it is almost incapable of definition, it is commonly and daily experienced by nearly everyone. This is why who names it shall never find it, and who substitutes the name for it, or who spends his life intoning the mantrams will, as the ancients themselves pointed out, fail in the work. He, why does he fail in the work? Because in the intoning of the mantra, 
he must by volition perform the action. Now, the point of involvement in the esoteric system is that insight completely removed from and apart from the volition of the will it makes possible the immediate apprehension of reality. In other words, the formula is that that which can perceive without being aware of the perceiving factor can and does perceive totally. In that instant, the universe bursts open and the individual beholds the radiant form of the symbol of the ineffable. As long, however, as perception is dominated by the will to perceive, as long as the individual looks because, as long as the consciousness of you being the one who sees remains, you are captured on the bridges which link the internal and the external. The moment your own sense of selfhood is permitted to stand between you and total apperception, you will never totally apperceive. Why? Because immediately that which is seen bears a relationship to the one seeing. The individual perceiving, we will say, a certain thing around him. Supposing he looks out and he beholds a house. As long as he sees a house, this in turn causes the rise of the qualities within the nature by which truth is blocked. The individual says, I like the house. I do not like the house. I like the color of the house. I wish I had the house. I am glad I do not have the house. The house is good. The house is bad. All of these resemblances and all of these relationships are based upon the acceptance of the individual as the judge of the house. He has determined, in terms of a kind of material utility, that which he will permit himself to see. And that which he sees, he likes, dislikes, accepts, or rejects upon the censorship of his own faculties. Thus, in all of this procedure, there can never be total definition, total understanding, total apprehension of house. If, however, the individual perceiving is unaware of himself as the perceiver, he does not con construe, qualify, or censor that which is perceived. In Vedanta and Yoga, therefore, truth is never further from any living thing than the power to perceive it without selfhood. And it can never be any nearer than the self will permit it to be. We are all seeking for the definition of truth. Truth is the absolute, unconditioned fact of a thing. It is that which absolutely is. We can only perceive this when we neither add to nor subtract from the testimony of the apperceiving power of the individual. And to achieve this, we must suspend the faculties of comparison, analysis, acceptance, and rejection. We must cease forever to say, what does this mean to self? And we must say, what is this? By taking, therefore, the mandala concept, the individual apperceives the nature of being 
from uh, the nature or substance of the Omkara formula. Now he may apperceive not only with his eyes, he may apperceive also with his ears. It is therefore absolutely necessary to disentangle the sense of hearing from the censorship of self-interest. The individual who hears only to interpret will never hear the voice of the silence. The individual who allows his ears to serve only as a channel between externals and his own ego will never hear more than the ego will permit. But the total absorption of the perceiving power in that which is experienced in hearing is the secret of the sacred mantra. And of course, here again, we are not dealing with something weirdly abstract and unbelievable, but something that you yourself can see, even if you cannot participate in it, by going to a great philharmonic concert or attending a great piece of symphonic music. You will find the audience divisible into a large number of specialized groups. Way up in the less expensive seats, the young students with a score, watching every note and studying every part of the performance. The individual who really was there by accident and wishes he was elsewhere, who will fidget throughout the entire performance and feel that every composition is too long. The individual who appreciates, who says to himself, I know music, therefore this is good. It is the way I feel it should be. The conductor is great. Or here is a version or a rendition with which I am not familiar. I doubt it. I am not willing to accept it as truly great because I have not already decided that it was great. Then you find the individual who is the true musician. And he is the individual completely lost in the music. He no longer knows that he exists. He has discovered a universe of sound. A total area like a great mandala. A tremendous symphonic pattern of acceptances. The music exists, he does not. And he awakens from this piece of music with a start, seeming to come back again into a world of conditioned existence. In the Vedanta and Yoga we know that the individual who is totally identified with the music is not a listener. He is the music. He has bridged the interval which divides himself as a being from the total experience which he wishes or which he is willing to accept. He is no longer analytical. He is no longer interested in composition alone or anything of that nature. He is responding totally to the sublimity of impact, the totality of music. Thus we live in also in a universe of sound. And we have something else. We live in a universe of form. While we examine form, estimate it as the artist does, we may be critical of this, critical of that. We are school bound. We are worried about modernism. We are worried about impressionism. We are worried about the pre-Raphaelites. We are worried about this, tradition against tradition against tradition. Then we have the individual who is the total artist. The total artist is completely free from the boundaries and barriers of tradition. He is seeking the experience of complete beauty. If he attains that experience, he is unaware of self. He is aware only of beauty. And being aware only of beauty, he is beauty. There is no longer any interval, nor is there any qualification of beauty. That which he experiences is eternal. 
Man seeking truth, seeking God, seeking the experience, therefore passes through this patterned formula. And this formula is contained in the concept of the three conditions which have to conspire wherever the situation of reality is possible. Therefore, the name is Adam, actually, the anatomy and physiology of the divine nature. Therefore, in the contemplation by Vedanta of total being, we are told that it may be experienced by different persons in different ways. To one, uh, the suspension of ego in the absorption in the circumstance or in the condition itself may loose a universe of sound. It may cause the complete experience of identity with sound. Or it may form an identity with color. Or it may form an identity with rhythm or motion. Thus was expressed in Taoism where reality is absolute rhythmic motion in which the self is completely lost by being one with a motion which is so profound and so tremendous that there is no longer the possibility of experiencing the motion and still remaining self-aware. In, in the uh, same system, there is presented to the individual in Vedanta and Yoga and in, under the symbolism of the ineffable name, the concept of a total and complete infinite being. An infinite being variously described and defined, but perhaps most available in Vedanta, at least, by the concept of absolute and infinite love. Now in this concept of absolute and infinite love, the mind has already been trained from that kind of affection which is truly personal to that kind which is truly universal. If therefore in the contemplation of the universe the mystic finds his total absorption or identification with the serenity, the beauty, or the divinity of the divine love, or the infinite compassion of the universal existence for the creatures which it has fashioned, then in this experience the individual ceases in the very fact of loving he becomes intimately, emotionally identical with the totality of the universal emotion as he senses it, feels it, or perceives it, without retaining any identity. Consequently, what is true self, the infinite self, which lies beyond the conditioned self? that very infinite self which is also symbolized by the Omkara emblem. That infinite self is the state of you in which you are unaware of your personal self. Therefore you cannot say of this infinite self, this is its shape, this is its nature, this it likes, this it does not like. Nor can you say to yourself, this I will explore. For the moment you turn your attention upon it, your personal selfhood is reborn and the thing ceases immediately. The true and absolute consciousness of life is that consciousness which is all perceiving without self-perceiving, that has no center but is diffused throughout the entire area of its acceptances. Thus identification brings with it this total sense of knowing without the sense of a knower, without the fact that you know anything. You are in a state of knowing 
but not in a state of self-knowing. And in this suspension of all faculties and all powers, you have an ineffable state. An ineffable state for which no conceivable symbol can be devised in its own uh, nature. Nothing can represent it. Perhaps the nearest thing to it would be light itself. But in this sense of the complete power to experience without central focus, you have infinite diffusion of self. You have the possibility of pointing out the, the situation described by the Swami Vivekananda, namely this sudden realization that you are everything simply because you have ceased to be something. Man must be something or everything. To be something is earth. To be everything is heaven. To be growing from something to everything is to be man. And this unfolding is represented by the bud. Therefore, in the ancient symbol, the A signifies the everything. Uh, the M signifies the something. The you is man, you, yourself. The you, the hook. The thing by means of which everything and something are in eternal relationship to each other. Therefore, within each individual is the infinite capacity to attain to everything by the absorption of self in the contemplation of existence. And whether this existence be a small flower growing in the garden, whether it be a great painting by Michelangelo, like the walls of the Sistine Chapel, whether it be a magnificent piece of architecture, like the Taj Mahal, or a tiny inscribed leaf of vellum by some ancient monk, that which causes the immediate sense of comprehension, the immediate absorption of self in the contemplation of that which is superior or that which is more than meaningful. Whenever this occasion takes place, the individual has the experience of samadhi. He has the experience of existing forever without existing as a person at all. In those moments of complete detachment from self, there is neither beginning nor end, old or young, up nor down. There are no attachments and no detachments. There is a complete absorption. And when this absorption is the result of man's directing his attention to sovereign reality, so that he is able to have the complete experience of reality apart from selfhood. When that occasion occurs, he is said to have completed the formula. And the form in which it comes may be one of three, and each will sound its own keynote. For in this final analysis, three factors are related, and the relation of these three factors makes the experience. So that your real nature the divine symbol in you is this mysterious thing by which you can be conscious of things without being aware that you are conscious. Thus, awareness is less than consciousness. Self-awareness blocks it. But the fact that there is a kind of consciousness superior to ego is demonstrated by its complete function free from ego. In fact, its perfect function under that condition. This is only the beginning of our discussion, but I see the time is up, so we'll save the next of it, the rest of it for next week. But we want to do a little more with the name, and then we want to go on to another phase of General Pike's researches.